What's going on guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel. I'm real sleepy. Been a long week out protesting and stuff, but it's time for another episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit. Today, we're gonna do two in a row. Some people are smart. Some people come in and they say, give me this and this. We don't know which. Eh, hard to say. Also, now that I have a chair that rotates, I have to imagine I will be doing this a lot in videos. Monkey Master Seb wants to talk about the perfect scholar, and so we shall. If you're liking what you're seeing, remember to... Can I, can I set this up? Can I set this up? Oh, like, subscribe, and ding the bell! I, I shouldn't have this chair. This chair is too much of a distraction. Clearly, I'm a toddler. For more Pathfinder stuff, remember, patronage in any tier gets you access to a Google Sheet this build is written out on for you. And hey, pledge at the higher tiers, you can come play with us today. This episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit was brought to you in part by one that's going to be real hard to pronounce. Here we go. Going to lean in. I'm super blind without my glasses, it turns out. Hey, Coddle. Thanks for your support, friend. Now, here we go. Okie dokie. So, Perfect Scholar, an archetype for the monk that many folks would say is kind of just a strict upgrade to the base monk itself. We're not really trading out anything super powerful for a lot of things that are just strictly better options. In place of Intimidate and Perform, we get Linguistics and Knowledge All, as well as half our monk level on Knowledge Checks and the ability to make Knowledge Checks untrained instead of Still Mind. But the real draw of this archetype, at least I think, is Learn from Failure. Beginning at level 4, if we miss with an attack roll or fail a research check, we're not worried about that too much today. Though hey, could be good if that's your jam. Our scholarly friend gets a plus one insight bonus on the next attack roll or research check against the same target attempted in the next 24 hours or your next attack in a flurry. An individual target cannot be affected by this more than once. At sixth and every two monk levels thereafter, the bonus goes up by one. What this means is, should you happen to roll a one on your first attack in a flurry, and since we're an Unchained Monk this time, we have a bunch of attacks at our highest bab. That means that you've basically set up exactly when you want to use a Style Strike, because you know you're going to get an egregious buff to it. If nothing else, this will shore up the attacks with smaller bab too. Or just your first attack in the next round is a giant Nova. Also, we can learn to read and write all languages in place of Tongues of the Sun and Moon. I don't think we're super concerned about that today. Today's build will have 18 levels of the Unchained Monk and 2 Inquisitor levels. God, I feel like I've talked about this archetype just too much, but it's really good for what we're trying to do. And since this build is going to be mad as heck, the ability to buff around our wisdom is just so much the better. In case you haven't figured it out by now, this build is really gonna want to make knowledge checks at things. Two levels of Inquisitor, in particular this time Sanctified Slayer just because I think Studied Target will get us a little farther, will grab us first off Monster Lore, the ability to add wisdom on all knowledge skill checks in addition to Int when making skill checks to identify abilities and weaknesses of creatures, which I have to assume is uh, most of the knowledge checks you will be making. With Cunning Initiative being able to add wisdom to initiative in addition to Dex means that again we're just trying to boil as many things down, at least one stat supported by one enormous stat. Our Inquisitor will worship the Master of Masters himself, Irori, and we're gonna grab the Memory subdomain, because Recall, with a touch, you cause a creature to recall some bit of forgotten lore or information, allowing them to retry any knowledge skill check made within the past minute, gaining an insight bonus on the check equal to Wisdom, not only one, spreads out our power amongst the rest of the party. Two, allows us to add our wisdom to things when it's not monster lore. And three, when it is monster lore, allows us to add our wisdom modifier twice. Now, I know somebody's gonna almost immediately push back on this. This is one of those very rare corner cases where you do get to add a modifier twice because we're not adding the modifier twice. We're adding an insight bonus and our modifier. It's super cheaty, it's super gamey, but it's also just super good. Now, generally speaking, when you're rolling to identify the abilities and weaknesses of a monster, the DC of that check is 10 plus the monster's challenge rating. This is probably the only time that I will tell you that a monster's challenge rating is actually kind of useful here, and not just an arbitrary number thrown out. That said, for comm mons, the DC is 5 plus CR, 
for like Cthulhu or the Tarrasque or something spoopy, it's 15 plus CR. For every five points by which you beat the DC, you can recall another piece of useful information. Make sure to have this on hand, some GMs will screw this up. But when we're adding double our intelligence, plus half our monk level, plus all of our ranks, plus our intelligence, plus even more stuff later, you should be able to grab a lot of information about the monster you're fighting pretty darn fast. And from there, it's just a matter of spreading that information out to the party. Knowledge, in fact, is power, but the other half still important. That gratuitous violence comes immediately after. This will make that easier. For our race today, y'all know me. I almost always pick my race based off of the favored class bonus, so the wisdom neg of the Amurin, or you know them maybe as catfolk, doesn't feel the best, but the buff to our decks is nice. The buff to our charisma is just kind of what it is. Chaw is a dump stat for us, but it's better than a race that would hit like our con or our int. We need a lot of stats to function. Gonna take a boatload of alternate racial traits on this one. We'll drop low light vision for scent because we can just cast light on ourselves, Mr. Inquisitor, and I think scent gets you farther. Sniff out the invisible thing. Cat's claws is pretty huge for this build as well. Replacing natural hunter with two primary natural attacks that do a d4 of damage and drop sprinter for a climb speed of 20 feet. Get up behind people, climb the walls and punch down, so on and so forth. But most importantly here, the favored class bonus of an Amurin monk, add half, half. Two levels gets you plus one to the monk's damage rolls with claw attacks and claw blades. Now this isn't Tekakagi, I'm not advocating for some weird ninja thing. Literally just a thing cat folk can put on their claws so they can treat them as light slashing weapons. If we select this at level one, so our first level will need to be a monk level, we also get to treat claw blades as monk weapons, which means we can use our style strikes with them, which means we can flurry with them which means we'll be stuck to a d4 for the entire game when we're attacking. But, and once again, we must tag in the mighty mahogany here. Our favorite class bonus means we're still swinging better on average than a monk with scaling unarmed strike damage dice, so it's a win-win. For our traits, reactionary is the easy one. Plus two to initiative looks good on everyone, but there's actually a couple of traits that will pad out unarmed strike damage. This I didn't know. Chwain Martial Artist gives you just a flat plus one trait bonus on damage with unarmed strikes. Deal. Easy peasy. For our stat priority, it's got to be wisdom in the first spot. It's our armor class. It's the majority of our knowledge checks. It's part of our initiative. It's a lot of things. You got to have it. Followed immediately by dexterity for, again, armor class initiative as well as attack and damage. Intelligence will be third. You want a higher int than a con and you want to pray you don't get crit to death because that would be scary but there are a couple feats that require us to have some pretty good intelligence and also again we're trying to pad out our ability to be smarty pants here con right after int then strength and shaw as low as you can make them this build on a 15 point buy probably not gonna be the best unless you get a lot of magic items or get really lucky was gonna do damage math for this one but since the stats are going to be so swingy across different metas point buys things like that it's truly just hard to say but let's talk some feats weapon finesse will be first followed by piranha strike because really we shouldn't have a lot of problem hitting folks with our lots of attacks at full bab and ability to pad stuff out. Weapon Finesse, of course, is just setting up for the Agile Enchantment to eventually buff out those Cat's Claws. And our next feat, we're gonna grab this one all the way back from 3.5 because it's just really good for us. It's basically what the build does anyway, so like, why not? Knowledge Devotion. Getting a free knowledge skill as a class skill is one thing, but Whenever you fight a creature, you can make a knowledge check based on its type. You then receive an insight bonus on attack and damage rolls against that creature type for the remainder of the combat. Not that creature, that type of creature. So, like, if a red and black dragon walk into the encounter, you identify the red, you would get a buff on the black as well. It's going to be real easy for us to make real big knowledge checks. This helps buy off our penalties from piranha striking. This helps our smaller attacks hit. This won't stack with learn from failure. Learn from failure will eventually outrun this, but this is the thing we're good at. Padding it out for combat seems super perfect to me. 
Next up, and I've heard a lot of people say this is a trap. I don't know, I have mixed feelings. Kirin style. Whilst using this style, you can spend a swift action to make a knowledge check to identify a single creature. Now, normally this is a free action, but this is a special one. If you pass the check while in Karin style, you gain a plus two on saves against that creature's attacks and a plus two to AC against attacks of opportunity from that creature. Plus two untyped bonus to saves looks good on everybody. We might as well be a chained monk with full bab at this point. Next up, combat rhythm. When you deal damage with a melee attack to opponents you have already whapped in the face this round, you can reduce the total of any voluntary penalties to your melee attack rolls imposed by actions or feats, think Piranha Strike, by one to a minimum of zero. This reduction in penalties lasts until the beginning of your next turn and stacks with itself. We should be able to buy off Piranha Strike real, real easy, given that we're swinging so many times at the top of our bab. Kirin Strike will be next. This is probably the worst feat in the build. The capstone to the Kirin style chain is better. This gives you a plus two insight bonus on knowledge checks made to identify creatures, including the one Kirin style allows. Again, not gonna stack with all the things, but it's there when you don't have the ability to kick on other things, but whilst using Kirin style against a creature you have identified as a swift action after you've hit them, you can do that weird anime sheath the claw blades and their head explodes to add twice your int modifier in damage. It's a weird intelligence smite evil, I guess. I don't know, I don't really like this one as much as some of the other things. Maybe that ship damage will get in. If nothing else, killing someone with this is like the best anime flavor ever. Hammer the Gap is next for that stacking wall of damage that anyone who makes a billion attacks in a full round just loves to have, cause like it hurts, it hurts really bad. Then Deific Obedience for the Master of Masters himself. Irori's obedience, which is super easy to maintain over the course of an hour, spend an equal amount of time practicing with your weapons, reading books, and braiding a length of hair. I guess kind of weird for the Amurin, but eh, it'd be fine. They never said it had to be a long length of hair. A plus four sacred or profane bonus on all knowledge checks is just gas for us. It'll stack with all the things. Diverse obedience right after so we can cherry pick from the boon paths. We'll be going sentinel sentinel evangelist this time. Sentinel for the spells because haste thrice a day, why not? I'm pretty sure that's still a typo. True strike once a day, haste thrice a day. That should probably be switched, but shh, don't tell. It's really good for us, so we'll keep it secrets of the enemy as a standard action. Study your opponent during combat, pass that knowledge check, which will be super arbitrarily easy for us for that plus two on weapon attack and damage. Then runic form from Evangelist for all those sweet tattoos for some healy stuff, for some re-rolly stuff, for some spell resistance, and a plus four sacred bonus to wisdom for a minute. Yeah, no, that's strong as hell. Anyway, lastly, at least from this side of the feats, Kirin Path. Whenever you make a knowledge check to identify a creature, even when using Kirin style, you can take 10. Just a flat, here it is, give me all your lore. Also, whilst using Kirin style against a creature you have identified using that feat, if the creature ends its turn within your threat range, you can spend a use of your attacks of opportunity that round to move up to 5 feet times your int, you must end your movement in a square that's threatened by the creature, your move does not provoke, it's just a free reposition. This will take a lot of creativity, and honestly jamming this on some kind of intelligence-based whip or Sarissa build could be really cool, but this lets you set up a flank, this gets you out of breath weapon formation, this gets you closer to a door that you need to open, the list goes on and on. Our monk's bonus feats are pretty straightforward, we'll grab dodge to buff our AC, deflect arrows cause a bonus feat that stops ranged attacks sometimes is not horrible, combat reflexes for more punching, especially when you end up on the ceiling, you'd be amazed how many things are gonna just run right through your threat range. Also, Karin Path letting you bop, bounce, jump, and move around is really good. Then Medusa's Wrath. Whenever you full attack and make at least one unarmed strike, you can make two additional unarmed strikes at your highest bab. These bonus attacks must be made against a dazed, flat-footed, paralyzed, staggered, stunned, or unconscious foe. Really, two of those you're just coup de grind. Come on. Why make 20 attacks when one will do? But when your casters are dazing and stunning things, 
should be real easy for you to get value out of this. To say nothing of if you just happen to go first in initiative. That's another reason the Inquisitor double dip looks really good. Improved critical, cause why not? And mobility, again, kinda, cause why not? For our style strikes, just as soon as we can get our hands on it, flying kick, the monk leaps through the air to strike a foe with a kick before the attack. The monk can move a distance equal to his fast movement bonus. This movement is made as part of the monk's flurry of blows and does not require an additional action. At the end of the movement, the monk must attack an adjacent foe. This movement may be between attacks. The movement provokes as normal. The attack made after the movement must be a kick, so no cat claws here, but this is pounce. This is a short range pounce. This is pummeling style. This is just really good. On the other side of that foot stomp, if you attack and hit, again, if we're buffing out from learn from failure, bet we did, the foe's movement is restricted until the start of the monk's next turn. The target of the attack can move only in such a way that the space it occupies is adjacent to the monk. Also, it can attempt a combat maneuver check against CMD as a standard action to break free. The strike doesn't work against foes that can't be tripped. You have to kick again to do this, but this is tanking 101. This is, nope, you can't move. Nope, you can only be adjacent to me, and that's it. Everybody else backs up. Giving your healers time to heal, folks time to drink their potions. Honestly, that's another tanky build in and of itself. Some monk stuff? Huh, hadn't thought of that. Defensive spin. Should you connect with this, you get a plus four dodge to AC against any attacks made by the target of this style strike until the end of your next turn. All the AC. Now, we're not going to talk about our spells in depth. We have some of them, but just not a lot. Your mileage may vary, pick what's good for you. Reaching back down to the 3.5 one more time, the Tome of Worldly Memory. A small book bound and hammered in silver and engraved with the continents of the world allows you to call upon the secret memories of the world by studying the book for one minute, you get a plus five competence. That Hey, that stacks with things, yeah. On a single knowledge check, it functions thrice a day. If you've got at least five ranks, you need only just pop a standard action. These things only set you back 1500 gold. I'm playing a Duskblade here at the house that has like four of these. And since this will basically just hand you an extra question about a monster, it's super good. To say nothing of if you do turn this against a research thing, give this character two days and you know all the plot. It's really sweet. Of course, the agile enchantment on our cat's claws will allow us to do dexterity to damage. And a monk's robe will let us treat our monk levels as four higher for the purposes of our bonus AC and unarmed strike damage, so that'll buff out the kicks on the style strikes and our just a little bit of armor class, literally just a plus one to armor class, and 2d8 becoming 2d10. But we're not necessarily concerned about this one at the beginning so much as like, say, when 1d8 becomes 1d10, when one can become two. In lower levels, this will help out quite a bit. And of course, get your big six, follow this card right up here, because this character is mad as heck. Now again, not talking damage math today, I really wanted to do it, but we're so multiple ability dependent that just like I can't give you a very concrete number here. Again, I would not advise playing this build in a 15 point buy, 20 or 25 if not rolling, honestly, because you just want so many things to function on this one. That said, when it does function, it should hit a lot for a lot of damage, be able to answer a lot of questions about things, help direct the party towards the right actions to kill something and not just like swinging into its DR or resistances or things like that, pointing towards immunities or even just like flavorful things you can do to the monster to get it to have bad tactics in combat. Sometimes that's just as helpful, but that's all the time we have for today. What do y'all think? Are we rolling this up? Are we punching? Are we kicking? Are we cats clawing? Let me know down in the comments. Next week, we're building around a strange patron request. Let's optimize around skills that aren't normally used. I, I have a really good video in mind for this. And I'll keep it under wraps till then. So again, thank y'all for watching. I'll see you next time.